Welcome back. Hottest show in the galaxy is the Karen Hunter show. We are here on Sirius XM Urban View. We're talking powers and becomes action. And I not only get to be here in community with y'all, but I get to talk to some people, uh, a lot of whom paths have crossed mine over the years. And I get to now celebrate all of the goodness that they're doing out in the world. And this is one of those uh, cases of sitting uh, it, at at the, at the uh, New York Daily News and watching this young lady uh, at the time, you know, we were very you were much younger than me, uh, Blossom. And then that first book came out, The Sister Rules, and you were like out of here. And uh, and now you you run your own company, you run your own company. You've written a lot of best selling books uh, like the Charlie Charlie Wilson biography. Some of y'all know Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. That was her, even though Steve Harvey's face is on there. Uh, Taraji P. Henson's Around the Way Girl. She's done a lot of things. My Brown Baby is uh, is her her parenting book. And then she's got a whole host of young writers for young babies because she loves making sure that our children have great content. And now she's back with a novel, One Blood. Let me welcome the great Deneen Milner. Hey. Me, the great Karen Hunter. How are you? Carl, wait, first of all, let me get more applause, please, sir. Alex, get the applause back uh, for Deneen Milner. Yes. Give this woman her flowers. Yes. yes. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm so proud and honored to be here. And let me tell you something, my brother, Troy Milner, is a huge, huge fan of your show. And when I started putting together the publicity plans for One Blood, he was like, you got to make sure you get on Karen's show. Make sure you get on Karen's show. So I'm super happy to be here. Hey, Troy. Well, listen, <laughs> uh, we were, were talking, I was like, how does it feel watching Stephen A? You know, because we all like around the same time, you know, he came in a couple of years after me and, you know, and then you were you were there, you know, at your desk. And it was like very few of us in the newsroom. But somehow uh, we managed uh, to to rise above the racism and and the other isms that were there to all of us kind of doing some things. Denise Milner. That's, hey, that's all I'm saying. Like, you know, I, I left. The Daily News, for very specific reasons, felt like, you know, they didn't really understand the magic and the power of Deneen Milner, and I got the hell out of there. But I can say, you know, between me, you, Stephen A., Curtis Bunn, we're all doing some amazing things in media that, um, you know, the Daily News was the launching pad for that. And I'll never, ever, ever stop talking about my experience there and what that did for my career. Cause you know, that was the start of where I got my, I, where I got my journalism chops and where I started writing books. So yeah, no big head, Stephen. You know, all of us is <laughs> big head. It was a little, little big head. Uh, it, and it's weird. You know, I was thinking about you today too, because it's like, it's, you can only, you know, you, how you meet somebody is almost like you're, you talk about your brother, you know, we, we're for kind of frozen in time sometimes with the people with where how we meet them. So you're only going to, you, you know, it's hard to kind of appreciate the progression because we're right. all growing. We're all right. growing. Right. So it's like I can only really see Stephen A one kind of way. So it's it's interesting. But I recognize, you know, that he's a thing. I recognize right. that you're a thing. But you're always going to be at that desk, you know, right That's as I'm right. walking you know, That's <laughs> through right. features. There you are sitting there and um you know, doing your thing. And uh, I'm, I am incredibly proud of you. And uh, so I wanted to say that. Right. I'm proud Thank of you, you too. I'm, I've been proud of you, bro. When you got that Pulitzer, I was just like, I'm trying to be like her. <laughs> well, like that her. was with the group. We're having a difficult conversation it. today. Yeah. Facts. True. All true. Um, You know, and, and at the same time, you know, I think about the responsibility of of having a voice you know you put putting out books putting out these articles writing um disseminating information you know because as we filter information it's through a lens that's maybe not ours right and usually we're working f through entities that aren't you know centered centering blackness or centering humanity even and you have to navigate those spaces that was the diff most difficult part for me on the editorial board is like, this is not just not my opinion. This is the opinion of somebody that may be my enemy, Absolutely. may be my opposition as a human being. Right. Right. Absolutely. I mean, 
I remember working at the Daily News and walking in with the, the mission to write stories, to shine a light on us, right? To shine a light on Black folks. Because we from a generation where, you know, it was still a, a thing to see Black people on the television screen or to see, you know, Black folks on the cover of the feature section of the Daily News or on the cover of a magazine. Like it was to be celebrated still because it still happened so little. And so when I went to the Daily News, I was like, I'm trying to write about us. And at every turn, I was told that I was pigeonholing myself, that, you know, like I would never, um, you know, my career would suffer if I just continued to write about Black people as if there was something, if as if it was something beneath a journalist to write about Black folks. But look at me now. Look at me now. <laughs> it's, you know, it's wild, it's wild about that. Um, I think we were right on the precipice of a breakthrough. Like we're in another breakthrough now. I tell my students to lean into who they are at Hunter College because we need everybody's story to be represented in media. So you bring yourself, you know, they tell you to be objective. You can't be objective because you're a human being. Bring your full self, be fair, you know, tell a story. But we need to see stories told through multiple lenses, not just Absolutely. one way of seeing the world. So you you broke through, you know, I broke through and it was kind of like a revolution in a sense. And I feel like we're in another one where now media is broken. Media is completely broken. So, you know, I, I'm I'm happy about that because now it I think it gives rise to the a, a possibility of other, you know, for us being able to have a real conversation, maybe not right now, right. about what what the world should look like uh, when there's no more oppression. Right. Is that right. possible? I, I mean, that that's a whole nother. I mean, I wish that I could see that in my lifetime. I just don't I don't I don't see that happening. You know, and I, I'd like to think of myself as still relatively young. I'm a, I'm a rock with that. But, you know, I just, the way that we disseminate news, we take in news, what we waste our time with versus what we should be, um, you know, embracing and, and really digging into. I mean, there are people with, you know, PhDs on Instagram telling people not to read the times because they're mad at something that they they read today. And that's crazy talk to me. There's still um you know, there's still there's still good journalism out there that we should be paying attention to. And there's new ways of disseminating information and new journalism that we also need to embrace, but we need to help them understand how to bring it all together and make it so that it it matters, it means something to folks, and I don't, I I just don't know how we're gonna do that. It takes, um, you know, veterans like you and me and Stephen Curtis, all these folks who know how to write a story, know how to find, you know, the the facts, you know, know how to know the difference between what's right and what's wrong, and go ahead and teach them how to do that. And you know, it's it's a scary time when. You know, you see the way that people take news in. Mm, it is. It really is. I'm, but I'm. I have to stay optimistic. I have to believe um, that whatever we're in, whatever we're in right now, is going to end, <laughs> one way or the other. And out of the ashes or manure, we're going to be able to build something good. Um, mm -hmm. Deneen Milner is here. Deneen Milner dot com is where I'm going to direct you to go to check her out she you know we're doing not a whole lot of twitter uh because i think that that thing is going away too um but you figured out how to take your journalism and, and spin it into novels into other kinds of works this one blood what is uh and i've seen you out with folk tina tina lifford i see you out there doing your book signings i love it i love it what what was important about this as you open this book with a specific date and with uh, what looks to be a young girl uh, having getting her period. What, right. What, why, why that? You know, I wrote the first three pages of One Blood while I was celebrating my birthday in Tobago with six of my best friends. And we were sitting on a cliff. Bourbon may have been involved. And I had a notebook and a pen and 
the sun was shining and it was beautiful. And I just felt like I needed to write something. And those were the first words that came out is me um, kind of reminiscing about what um, what life means, right? I, I turn in 50, I'm thinking seriously about life. I have more years behind me than I have in front of me, most likely, right? And so I was thinking about life and what it means and and how we're interconnected and certainly connected by the blood and life, you know, menstruating and being able to have your body be a portal for human souls. What does that mean? And when do we start thinking about it? And that's why I started the book in that way. I was thinking I was in a very reflective mood that day. Um, but the book is about three specific women, one, a birth mother, a young teenage birth mom who has her baby taken away from her, um, the adoptive mom who adopted that child, and the child as a mother and wife and um, career woman and in, uh, you know, as an adult. And I wanted to examine what how these women, how these three women are sort of forced into this box and how, what they have to do to overcome all of the different isms, classism, racism, sexism, colorism, you know, patriarchy, and, you know, what they have to do to heal that trauma and get to freedom. It's based in part on um, my own life, uh, I found out when I was 12 that I was adopted and didn't tell my parents and never got to talk to my mom about it. She passed away before she knew that I knew. I never told them. And I talk very rarely about it with my father. And so I've, I've always had questions about my, my adoption, what happened to my birth mother, um, you know, how my parents came to adopt me, why they did, why they couldn't have kids. Um, and then I wanted very much to... Um, examine the life of my own mother, the woman who raised me. We had a very, um, you know, like line. It was, you know, I'm the mother, you're the child. You, you are to be seen and not heard. You are to do as you're told. And, um, you know, and once you become a grown up, then you'll understand why I did the things that I did. But I remember sitting and watching my mother with her friends and seeing her as a woman without her understanding that I knew that she was more than just my mom. I saw her with her friends. I saw her with my father. I saw her, you know, make decisions at work, make decisions for herself. And I, you know, I always thought that her life and the life of her friends deserved an exploration, right? These solidly middle-class Black women, wives and mothers, working, living, loving, going to church, jogging for Jesus, all of that stuff. But they were, it felt like to me in, in media, just invisible. And I wanted their lives to, to have the, the, an airing, some light. And so this book is um, me asking questions of both of my mothers, my birth mother and my adoptive mother of what it means to, what it meant to be a woman at the time that they were um, becoming mothers, uh, what it meant to be a woman, a black woman in a time where, you know, as a woman, you couldn't even sign your own lease without the permission of a man or have a credit card without the, 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 uh, the permission of a man. You had to use your ability to be a mother and a wife as your currency to survive, literally. And I wanted to know how they did that and how they came out on the other side to be the kind of women that they ultimately ended up being. So everything that I ever wanted to ask them, I asked of those characters and they answered me back. Oh, that's so, mm. Denise Milner is here. Uh, One Blood is the latest. Um, she has a, uh, a whole arsenal of books. And I love that you explored this in a novel. You have written about this. Um, I, I knew the story. I never knew why you didn't tell your mom that you knew and how you found out. And you do you explore that here? Why why didn't you tell that you knew? I I did. I did explore it in the book. Um and the character kind of the character, her name is Ray, she kind of um 
makes the same decisions that I did. Um, I didn't want to tell them because first I, I thought I was going to get in trouble for snooping through their papers, right? Like you just don't go rummaging through people's stuff and then get away with it. And I, you know, like at eternal journalist, I was nosy even at, you know, 12 years old. Um, but then also I felt like if it was a secret that they wanted to keep that was important to them, then it was important to me. And I was okay with keeping that secret. It wasn't until I got much older within like the last couple of years, mostly while writing One Blood, that I started thinking about it differently and understanding that, um, you know, as a child of adoption, we have the right to know our origin story and we have the right to answer questions or ask questions and have them answered. And um Carrie Washington has a book out now that um, mm -hmm. uh, Thicker Than Water, and she's talking about how she felt all her life in her family that she wasn't close enough to her father and she couldn't figure out why and come to find out just a few years ago um, that she was the product of a sperm donation, that her father is not her biological father and how that made her feel. And I've read stories about it. I'm reading the book now. And she said that she um, felt like she always felt like she was the supporting actor in her own story, in her own familiar story. And I can identify with that. And I, you know, like, that's not me saying that I I, I don't consider myself a product or a piece, a, a thread in the fabric of the Milner clan. I absolutely am. My parents are my parents. My brother is my brother. It's never felt any kind, I've never felt any kind of way about being um, a Milner, right? But I have my origin story. I know that there's, you know, like a beginning to me that I never got to um, explore, or ask questions about, or know, because um, when you're adopted, particularly from, from our era, uh, people expect you to keep that quiet. They expect you to just pretend as if none of that mattered, that your life began when you got with your adoptive family. And, you know, that's deeply unfair, right? And they, folks expect you to keep that, those secrets, because it makes everybody else feel better, right? It's like, well, we were dealing with some infertility issues and we don't want anybody to know that. So we just going to pretend like, you know, you you came from our womb or people don't need to know our you know backstory or your backstory or that you were uh you know given away and so we're not going to talk about it but it is something i recognize now that i've always um sort of pushed down into the reserve out of respect for everyone else without showing respect to myself mm. and so mm. um out of respect to myself, I recognize that I have a birth family and I, I have a whole nother set of, of folks who um, who come with me, a whole set of ancestors, the Milner ancestors and the ancestors that are related to me by blood. Um, it's nature and nurture and both of them are important. One Blood, a novel, uh, Denise Milner, the writer, uh, I was reading or listening to, I think it was Stolen Focus, and it talks about the power of reading novels, mm -hmm. the power of reading novels, because it taps into your humanity in a way that nothing else does. It it makes children more empathetic. So to tell a story like this through characters, through a novel, true story, through a novel, uh, really important really important. Um, and as you're talking, I'm also thinking about the collective us, the black folk who have been uh, adopted, not by not not because we, you know, were thrown out by our birth continent parents, ancestors, but because we were stolen, much yes. like many Native Americans, indigenous people stolen from their homes to be reeducated. Um, what's our identity, right? As you're talking, I feel like in that there's also power in the self-determination, which is today Kuji Chagalia and the naming of ourselves. And part of the success that I think you you experience is because you had to forge, make your own name. Right. In many right. ways. Right. Absolutely. I mean, 
<clears throat> I'm a part of a, uh, I'm on a board of an organization that specifically tries to help parents, people who want to be foster parents navigate the system. And I was invited after attending this um, workshop where they were trying to figure out what this organization was going to be like, what would they, how would they be helpful and what would they, what would they offer to these families? And I was invited because I had a parent, a really successful parenting website and that none of them knew that I was adopted. And when I sat down at the table and revealed that I was adopted and, you know, kind of set the record straight, like when you think of black folks and adoption, you think automatically of white parents adopting black children. You don't think of black families adopting black children. It's always been sort of this misnomer that black folks don't adopt black children. Okay, so first of all, you know, like I'm here to tell you absolutely it does. Bevy and James Milner adopted me, right? Um, so that's, you know, and, and we were surrounded by people who were either fostering or had adopted um, children. I remember that specifically. Um, but no one talks about fictive kin or um, off the books adoptions, right? So fictive kin, meaning we're not, related by blood, but if something happens to the blood parents, you know, auntie down the street or got ma, you know, in the next neighborhood, or, you know, someone is going to make sure that that child is taken care of. And that is directly related to all the different ways that our families were separated. And we came together to make sure that, you know, if, you know, if you're talking about the plantation, if a child was taken from his parents and put on another plantation, somebody there was going to parent that child. Somebody there was going to be a big sister, an auntie, a father to that child. That child would not be alone, right? That carried down through the generations. And just because it's not, there's no paperwork behind it doesn't mean that Black folks aren't taking care of one another. I'm surrounded by people, Black folks who care for one another. I got so many nieces and nephews who are not blood related to me, who get, you know, phone calls on birthdays, get taken out at graduation, that, you know, get help with homework, that get babysat when mama got something to do. Like we all know that we take care of one another. And just because it's not written down on paper somewhere in ink doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And so, um, you know, that's something that I wanted to make sure that people really understand, um, not just through the book, but just in general, that Black folks take care of Black folks. We do. We always have. Amen. Amen. You have you have many books um, <laughs> like your children. Which one most is this the one that most resonates i don't want to say resonate um i'm trying to find the perfect word which i'm probably not going to is this the book that ties us to you the most of all of the books that you've done oh most definitely most definitely i mean this is the one that um that i put my whole whole heart into that is just solely my own telling my own story, right? Like when I write for Taraji or I've written for um, Steve Harvey or I've, I wrote, you know, Charlie Wilson's story, I was more of a surrogate, right? Like I like carried the baby, I nurtured the baby. And then when the baby was ready to be born, I birthed the baby and handed the baby over to the parent and the parent went out and, you know, accepted that this was their child and that they, they talked about it, they cooed over it, they, you know, made sure that the world knew that they had this child and um, they wanted you to read it, right? This is my crazy dog. Um, but One Blood is my story. It's wholly of my creation. It's wholly of my imagination. It is my voice. It is, um, you know, my story. And, you know, I get to claim it all my own. And I'm super proud of it. I'm proud of it because it's some of the best writing that I've ever done in my entire career. It's my 33rd book, but the best writing that I've done in that oh, entire out of all of all. Come on through. Books. You better flex, <laughs> flex. Stay with it in a moment. My 33rd book. Come on through. 33. 
33. Jesus age. I love it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 33. So, it is, so, it is. Yeah. The choice to go through Forge and not your own, because you you got your own thing. You got your own thing. You your own boss. You your own you you your your own powerhouse, Denny Milner. Yeah. Talk about that decision. Oh well, you know, Forge gave the kid a good amount of money. <laughs> <laughs> you better yes. Forge Dollars. made sure that, that this was this was adequately more, above adequately compensated and um forge tour mcmillan is the company that um is responsible for everything from the editing to the packaging to the marketing promotion publicity production you know there's a whole team of folks um who are responsible for um you know making sure that it sees the light of day and when it comes to self-publishing, it's just not one of my strong suits. It, it never was. Um, you know, every book that I've done except for one was um, through traditional publishing. And um, the one that was not traditional publishing actually got turned into a documentary and won an Emmy like, <laughs> like, like a, a month ago or so. Um, but it, you know, like it never, it never sold. I couldn't figure out the formula, the secret sauce to get people to know that it was there and to have them, you know, understand the work that we put into it and what it meant to folks. Um, so One Blood was, I always knew that I wanted to write this book and I always knew that I wanted it to be in a home that would treat it with the respect that it deserved. And one um, Macmillan is, you know, the publisher and it's going to be published in seven other countries before. I see already you and you, you have a there's a there's an image of you with it with in different languages. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is big. This is big. <laughs> how, how you know, how is it being received other places? It's wild. Like in Germany, it came out in Germany in May. And I'm on the, I was on the cover of some magazine there, um, which is like, are you serious? Cause in, in America, I can't even get the times to give me a side eye, <laughs> let alone, you know, like a review or, you know, any kind of a story. I don't know too many folks out here who've written 33 books and, you know, had, have a, a book that's coming out in eight different countries, but you know. I, I I got no love from, <laughs> from my home newspapers, um, but in Germany I'm on the cover of a magazine, like and in and I'm constantly being tagged by people in France. Um, Dumaine Seng is the name of the book in in French, and they're constantly yes. tagging me about you know like and in French, you know, ex, uh, you know, saying that they love the book. It's wild to know that you know, these stories, these characters, these words are out there um, all over the world and being um, embraced and folks are hearing the story and knowing how much I love my mothers um, and wanted to honor them with these words. 